We are so glad you're joining us today for the second message in the Lord I Am Listening sermon series by Pastor Alan Galloway. This message was recorded on January 14th, 2024 at First Christian Church of Napa. Well, let me ask you, uh, what are you listening to? Pastor Allen? Uh, <laughs> seriously, what, what, what was kind of on the radio, your uh, iPod, what, as you were coming in, what have you been listening to this week, today? Silence. silence. Listening to silence? Okay, that's good. That's good. Anybody else? This is part of the interactive service. We're giving out new cars to anybody who participates. Whatever it takes, right, to each other, anyone, <laughs> right? Lots of things we can be listening to, but what we want to do is we want to learn to listen, lean in and listen to what God has for us, especially as we start the year beginning of the year. In fact, last week we kicked off this prayer series and we gave out these cards. If you were with us last week, you would have gotten one of these cards. Maybe you brought it with you. It's shoved in your Bible. You haven't even thought about it all week. That's okay. You're in good company. Uh, Maybe you didn't get one of these cards. We do have a handful left, and they are uh, in the lobby uh, on one of the tables. And I just invite you to, to grab one of these, because what I'm asking you to do is to really lean in and ask the Lord uh, for a word, for a verse, for some direction for you as you go into the beginning of this year. And um, one of the things that we're doing is the title of this series is, Yes, Lord, I'm Listening. And so we have a lot of resources that are available. I think you probably grabbed the uh, QR code from the screen. And if you didn't, we have these resources that we're releasing each week uh, as a tool to help you continue to journey together, to learn how to listen to the Lord, leaning into that, some new exercises. So each week, something new. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit more about that. But right now... What I want to invite you to do is to lean in. And if you have this card, just go ahead and take it out right now. If you don't, you may have something else to write on or keep a note in your phone. I just want to give you a moment to lean in and to hear what God might be wanting to say to you today. So let's just do that together. Let's just close our eyes. Just take that big, deep breath. Kind of feel yourself in the chair. Just you're here in this moment. And that simple prayer of, yes, Lord, I'm listening. I'm going to be kind of the prayer of your heart, the meditation of your mind. To be still, to know that he is God. Yes, Lord, we are listening. We're listening. Maybe God prompted something in you. Uh, It could have been a relationship. It could have been a scripture, a verse uh, that the Lord is highlighting for you. Um, It could be something else. I just encourage you, whatever that is, jot that down. You could use this card. You could use a journal. And continue in that over these next few weeks as we want to hear what God has to say, what God is revealing to us. Uh, Last week, we were in John chapter 10. We're going to continue in the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible, swipe right from John 10 to John 15. John 15 is we're going to pick up today. And last week, we talked about this idea of hearing God. God speaks to his people The theological term for that is sheep. Yes, that's you. You are a sheep. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm a sheep. You got to do it like a sheep. I'm a sheep. Right? Not a goat. Somebody told me last week, hey, I'm a goat. I was like, man, goats got no hope. So uh, do not be a goat, but be a sheep. And what's that really mean? It means that Jesus is the good shepherd. He shepherds his sheep. They follow him, so we were followers of Jesus. And today we're going to look at the idea that we're friends with Jesus. And speaking of friends, we got a lot of snow. Any snow skiers, snowboarders here? Yeah, a couple friends actually went snow skiing. And uh, one of them, at the end of the day, had a bad fall. 
That crash broke their hip. Uh, horrible, horrible, horrible situation. Uh, they're going to find themselves in the hospital now for several weeks. Had surgery, laid up, going to have to go through all the therapy. And uh, as they were sitting there, recognizing this is going to be really boring, <clears throat> they asked their friend, said, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you pick me up a book or something, you know, just to help pass the time? I, I need something, some kind of resource. And sure enough, friend went out, picked up a book. Uh, uh, it was a new book, uh, not one laying around the house. Picked up a book, brought it to them, but went to the nurse's station and just put a little note on it. Hey, this is for my friend. They're in room such and such. We could pa- pass it on to them. Check did what I was asked to do. Now, they got another friend, right? So that's the one type of friend, one level of friendship. They have another type of friend who, same request, hey, can you get me something? I'm super bored. Not only did they go out and get a couple books, but they picked up several magazines that their friend who's laid up in the hospital uh, uh, likes and interests. And not only that, brought an iPad because, again, it's like, you know, Uh, I need to stay in tune with what's happening around the world. And it only gets better than that because they also brought In-N-Out Burger. (laughs) Really, really good friend. I mean, this is a good friend. In fact, they stop by not just that one time, but they find themselves stopping by a couple times a week to visit with this friend. And on the weekend when they have time off, they're bringing like a deck of cards or playing cards. They're just hanging out together. Now, let me ask you, which friend would you prefer to have? Easy question, right? Friend number one. (laughs) Let me ask you. No, friend number two, right? What kind of friendship is God looking for? Hmm, keep that in mind today as we kind of go a little further. See, let me say it another way. If we're learning to hear God's voice and discerning God's voice and growing in that understanding, if we just stay at a surface level, we're going to remain surface level in our friendship with God. But God wants to do something more. God wants to, uh, to build something. He wants to build a relationship. We talked about that last week, a personal relationship with each and every one of us where we're not just simply followers of Jesus. We don't just, like sheep, follow his voice. But we really know him. We're like friends because we hang out with him. And that's what this passage in John chapter 15 really, I think, unpacks for us today. John 15, verse 15 Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says this powerful turn in their relationship. He says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Now, let me bring it up. Here's the New Life, uh, New Living Translation. I like how it says it here. I no longer call you what? Slaves. That's a, that's a kind of relationship, a servant, a slave. That's one that would be very common in the day of the disciples in Jesus' day. Because a master doesn't do what? Doesn't confide in his slaves. In other words, there's not like intimate details being shared. There's not deep revelation. There's not insight that's being shared. This is a personal level of friendship that he's starting to refer to. Now, You are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. Now, I want to note something here, right? This doesn't mean that Jesus finished communicating all his plans to the disciples, right? In other words, he continues to communicate with his disciples today. If you are a follower of Jesus, that would mean that you are a disciple of Jesus. And we talk about it around here, a disciple is simply this. I'm following Jesus. I'm being changed present tense, by Jesus, and I am committed to the mission, the way of Jesus. I mean, that's simply what we would say as a disciple. And so he's speaking to his disciples with that same kind of idea and that they're leaning in. So Jesus is saying, while I was on this planet, while I'm here, because it was for a window of time, I told you everything I was to tell you. In other words, everything that I was instructed to share with you, not everything, but what I was instructed to share with you, I gave to you. What you need to know, I released and I gave it to you. Jesus came, don't miss this. Jesus came from heaven to earth, skin on, skin in the game, right? He came that we might have a right relationship with God, with the Father. That's what he came. That was his intended purpose of his first 
incarnation of his first coming, this reestablishment of this relationship of his people, God's people, to God. And in that relationship, this personal communication is established, moving from a very formal or what we would say a slave, a servant type of language, a servant type of relationship communication to a much more f- uh, friendship relationship, in fact, a deep form of friendship. So I want to keep that in the background as I kind of dive a little deeper. I want to just highlight three things that I think for us as growing in our walk with Jesus and our relationship with Jesus that are foundational to being a friend with Jesus. And this very first one I think might sound a little strange, especially in the light of artificial intelligence, right? Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, it's like everywhere you turn. Right, is this actually a robot calling me? Well, let me, before I go down that tangent, right? Here's the first point. God is not building friendship or relationship with robots, right? Just in case anybody was wondering. I mean, it's amazing, you know, how much technology is advancing, especially in such a short window of time over the last few years. We see uh, artificial intelligence in, you know, multiple uh, streams of life. But here's the point. We're not created as robots, though some of us live like we are. Did that push anybody's button, right? I said this last week. Uh, You know, you have limits. You're not limitless. A robot just goes and goes and goes and goes, and some of us try to follow that same pattern. We just try to go and go and go and go and go and go and go, and then we get some new energizer Batteries, so we can go and go and go and go, right? That's not who we are. We are created as people. We're human beings, not robots. We're created in the image, the likeness of God. First Thessalonians 5 tells us that we are triune beings. We're body, we are soul, we are spirit. Triune, Father, Son, Spirit. We are created in that likeness of God. We're not created as gods, but we are created in the likeness of God, the image of God. And God wants to communicate with us. He wants to communicate at a deep level uh, with us as his spirit to our spirit. In other words, God communicates. You have a spirit in you. And God is spirit, John chapter 4. Take a little note of that inside of your Bible to look at it this week. God communicates spirit to spirit. It's really important, foundational truth. So think of it this way. There are maybe, there are multiple ways to communicate, but there are probably two major primary ways communication happens in our world today. The first one would be communication between machines, mechanical, right? Machines talk to machines. People talk to machines. Uh, Then there is communication between persons. This is personal. What? People to people. So, if anybody has, does anybody have an iWatch, iPhone, an iProduct, yeah? You can talk to who? Siri, right? Siri, read John 15, 15. Yeah, uh, it's not working. It's not working, right? When I don't want Siri to butt in and listen to me, right? It sounds like you're familiar with that, right? So, so uh we can talk with uh, machines. If you have a car and you want to go faster, you do what? You press the accelerator. If you feel like you're going too fast, if you're driving with, you know, someone, I'm not going to point at anybody, uh, you're going to, you know, press the brakes. So we communicate persons to machines. Uh, people talk to people. I got an email years ago, and it kind of said this. You're not going to believe this, but this message has been sent by a robot, not a live human being. Now, this was like several years ago. Today, I get like six or seven of those a week. Do you, right? I mean, you get a phone call. It's like, is this a robot calling me? Right? Rise of the machines. Am I right? Remember, we are not machines. We are created as children. We're not machines. We're not mechanical. But sometimes our pace of life, like we think we are. We can do all these things. We can do everything that we want to do. It's just not the case. We're We're limited. But even better than that, we are created as God's children. We are people. Now, I want to show you, maybe you're in John, but if you want to flip over to Genesis 18, there's this great story about what I'm trying to communicate today uh, in Genesis chapter 18. It's really interesting because I think it shows God's desire to do this development of relationship with us, uh, to a deeper level of friendship. 
In fact, verse 17, Genesis 18, 17 says this. Abraham has had this encounter. Three visitors, uh, divine visitors, have come to visit him. And he's kind of in his midway journey with the Lord. God's called him to leave his family, his home, uh, everything, and follow God. And so Abraham's referred to as the father of faith because of all these faith steps that he took in his life. And so he's, you know, into this journey with the Lord, this faith journey, and this event happens. Verse 17, he says, and then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he had promised. Let me just pause here for a second. Abraham, again, as I said, is in the middle of a God encounter. Three visitors have come. They are divinely sent by God. And in fact, many theological scholars would say that one of them is a representation of God, a pre-incarnation of Christ. So kind of keep that there. And so they're giving him a message and they're speaking a blessing over him about him becoming the father of many nations. Verse 20, then the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Now, Abraham knows about Sin City, and he knows all about what's happening there. And it's kind of interesting, this conversation that's taking place. Yeah, at first glance, you think, God's not aware of what's happening there? What's going on? Okay, there's something more happening behind the scenes. Am I right? So keep with me here. Verse 22, then the men turned away, because there was three of them. So essentially two of them (coughs) uh, are taking off. And they went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So there was three of them with Abraham. Two of them are leaving. One is standing there. Then Abraham approached him. Now, this reveals a lot about Abraham and God and their relationship, and I think it's really important for us as we think about our relationship with God. And if we want to hear God speak, we, we want to discern from God, we want to uh, listen to God, we want to slow down. We want to stop what we're doing. We want to draw near to God. So Abraham, verse 23, approached him and he said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? It's a good question. At so many levels, will you sweep away the righteous, those who are seeking to follow you, God, those who who love your ways, God, with those who are very much against you? What's happening here? Abraham has enough relationship with God by this point in time. He knows God. Or better way to say it, he knows God's character. He knows what God's like. And so he's kind of, you know, leaning in with a question that he kind of already knows. And I'm going to read through this next section pretty fast. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it. Far be it from you to do such a thing. All right? I mean, can you just imagine that, this conversation going on, right? Uh, you ever have one of these, like, far be it from you, God, to do this, right? The God, let me remind you who you are, God. <laughs> I've done that. I've had those kinds of prayers, you know, usually when things are not going my way. Lord, let me remind you that promise that you, no. Let me just keep going. Okay, okay. <clears throat> to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare it, the whole place, for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy a whole city for lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now, that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord. What if only 20 can be found there? And he said, 
For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Okay, verse 32. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? See, again, he knows the city, right? Some of you know the story. He's got a nephew there. He understands what's going on. Look how God answered. For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. All right, why this story in the scripture? What is happening here? What's taking place? Now, I think there's a number of things that are happening, which is a lot of times when you read the scripture, there's multiple things happening. The scriptures has a simple, plain message to it, but it's also supernatural. And, it, uh, and the way God speaks and the way God communicates can be multidimensional. Here's what I think is happening. At one level, Abraham and God are having this encounter, this interaction back and forth. And... Um, Abraham, God leaves and Abraham heads back home. And I think God is sitting there in heaven and he's kind of like with Michael and Gabriel, the archangels, and he's kind of giving them one of these. Did you see that? Did you see what just happened there? Did you see what Abraham did? Did you see how he kind of threw out that far be it from you, Lord? Did you see what Abraham did? I love that. Man, I like that Abraham guy. We are going to be good friends. I, I think at one level, that's what's happening here. God knew that Abraham was going to start with 50 people. And then he was going to kind of kind of work his way down, down, and finally get to 10 people. I think God knew that well in advance. So why in the world put this in the Bible? Why even bother? Some of us would say, God already knows what I'm going to pray. God's already going to do what God's going to do. Why bother? I think what's happening is God is stirring this relationship with Abraham. God is not interested in building a relationship with a robot. He wants to talk with people. He wants to engage in relationship with his creation, with his children. Another story that might be similar is the one with Elijah. Some of you know the story of Elijah. Elijah has had this incredible miracle event with God, and then he runs off scared and depressed, and he's in this cave, and he's just down and everything, and he just says, God, I'm the only one who seeks you. There is nobody else on the face of the earth who seeks you. And God's like, really? Really, you know everyone at all times, everywhere? You are limitless? Okay, I'm paraphrasing. Pastor Allen's translation, the Bible you could pick up a copy for $9.95 in the lobby. No. But, what, but I think it's important. It, God's, you know, reminding Elijah that, no, I've got and reserved many who will follow me and not bow the knee to the false demonic gods of the day. See, I think all throughout Scripture, you see God communicating with people, his people, his desire to communicate with them. Why? Because God likes people. Turn to the next one and say, God likes you. God likes you, right? Some of us go, yeah, God loves me. He has to. He's God. But man, God likes you. He likes hanging out with you. He, he's interested in the things that are interesting. He's, he's interested in what's weighing on your heart. God likes you. He loves to hang out with you. He wants to create a relationship with you, not a robot. So again, we're created people. We're created in God's image. And God wants this personal relationship with us. So the first thing, again, is that idea that God doesn't build relationship with robots. But what God does this. God communicates with people. That's kind of the second thought here is that God communicates with people. Now, it sounds real simple, huh? It's like, well, duh, Pastor Allen, yeah. Duh. I mean, all throughout Scripture, God is communicating with people. He begins with Adam and Eve and then to Noah, Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Deborah and Ruth and on and on through the Scriptures. God is communicating with people in different ways and different methods. Uh, I said last week that God communicates. I can tell you that God communicates like in 40 different ways. Well, that number is now up to 50 this week, right? God is communicative in all kinds of ways that he wants to communicate. In fact, Jesus comes skin, God with skin on, the incarnation, communicates in a very powerful, different way. Everything begins to shift and change. But it doesn't end there because he dies, he's buried, he rises again, and he continues to communicate. Because it's not just with Peter and James and John, but all of a sudden Paul comes on the scene and Titus and Timothy 
and Silas. God is communicating. And he continues to communicate with his people. And today, God is communicating with his people. God is no less communicative today than he is with those that we read about through the scriptures. And that might be something that kind of need to really come to terms with that. In John 16, verse 12, Jesus is saying, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Who's going to speak to you, and who's going to tell you the things to come? The spirit. Who's the spirit? God, right? <clears throat> Listen, God doesn't stop talking, right? 2,000 years ago, at the completion of the scriptures, God is continuing to communicate to you. Somebody's alarm's going off. God's communicating to you, <laughs> right? John 15, 15, we're no longer what? Slaves, we're no longer servants, who don't know the intimate details of the master's business and what's on God's heart. No, we are what? We're friends. We are friends. Say that with me. We are friends. We're friends. And though Jesus had a season on the earth where they, the disciples could see him and touch him and be in that presence, it was for a window of time for a specific purpose. What John 16, that's what Jesus is saying John 15. We come to John 16. He's saying, look, I have so much more. I told you what I was called to tell you for that time, but there is so much more to come. There's so much more I want to reveal. And as a result, God's spirit, triune, right? We're triune, Father, Son, Spirit. The spirit of God is going to come. It's going to reveal more at the right time. Fast forward, Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit comes and descends with power, and people begin to hear the gospel, and the church just continues to explode in growth, right? Everybody tracking with me? At the right time, at the right time. Now, me personally, I think that God, how God speaks in the scripture that we read about really is no different than today. Somebody caught me right before the service started and said, God doesn't speak like in that audible voice or I haven't heard that yet, but God speaks to me. And I was like, okay, keep going with that. Keep going, because that's exactly, he was stealing my notes. That's exactly where we're gonna go, is that, in other words, God just speaks audibly. God speaks audibly to you. Okay. Uh, hang with me here for a second before you pick up some stones to toss. This is what I'm saying by this. God is spirit. We are made in God's image, his likeness. We have a Spirit. So God's spirit speaks with our spirit. John chapter 4. Again, <clears throat> here's what uh, the scripture is, is speaking to. Another passage of scripture that's really important for us. Write this down. Hebrews chapter 11. Many of you are familiar with Hebrews 11. It is the heroes hall of faith, right? Uh, all the heroes of the faith that were just so noted for their faith and what they did. It was all, be, all before they had the spirit of God living and residing in them. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've given your life to Jesus. You said, hey, I'm following Jesus, getting baptized, a representation of my full devotion to Jesus. His spirit is residing and living in you. Then you are alive in Christ. Christ is in you, the hope of glory, as Colossians says. This is this powerful picture. His spirit speaking to your spirit. Now, as you read through Hebrews chapter 11, you read about all these heroes of the faith and how it says about them, by faith, they did this. By faith, they did that. By faith, they conquered this. I mean, on and on, by faith, by faith, by faith. If it was a strong, audible voice, as we think of an audible voice, why would it say, by faith? Not even more appropriate to say, by fear. I mean, the voice of God, as we read in the scripture, is pretty powerful. That audible voice, lightning, 
thunder. I mean, the children of Israel, as they came out of uh, their captivity in Egypt, were just terrified. They even said to Moses, you know, you've got to go before us. You've got to speak to God on our behalf because if we do, we're going to surely die. Yeah, rightfully so, right? I mean, it's powerful. How did Elijah describe it? It wasn't through the shaking of the earth. It wasn't through a violent wind, but how? Still small voice. God's audible voice, spirit, speaking to your spirit. Please hear me. I believe that God is communicating. I, I believe that God can communicate in so many different ways. And how he has, but one of the ways that he speaks is his spirit to your spirit. What if those heroes of the faith heard God with their spiritual ears, kind of like what we have, and by faith followed what God had called them to do, just like we do. Huh. Interesting, right? Take Moses, for example, right? Goes out and has this encounter with God through a burning bush. Very peculiar. Am I right? I went out over the weekend, pouring down rain. I was like, put God to the test. No burning bushes in my backyard. <laughs> now, just so you know, we don't see that in scripture again, but it was a way God was communicating with Moses at the time. I think here's what was happening. There's a miraculous event, a sign of wonder that takes place. And I think Moses was hearing God speak to his spirit. So when he hears, take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground, it was God's spirit speaking to his spirit. When God said, I am, multiple times, I am your father, it was God's spirit speaking into his spirit. Because later in the conversation with Moses, Moses asked the question, what's your name again? <laughs> what am I supposed to call you when I go and talk with people? If it had been an audible, thundering, loud, booming voice, I don't think he would have forgot it. I think he'd have been terrified. Hmm. This is what my commentary here. Another hero of the faith I think there's many is Gideon. Gideon is known to be one who put out a fleece, right? He was asking God, praying for God. God's giving him some direction, and he puts this fleece out. Why did he do that? It's because what Judges 6 tells us, verse 17, if, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that is really you talking to me. Again, if it had been a big, booming, thunderous voice, why would Gideon ask for a sign for his doubt? Huh. Everyone, here's what my contention is, or, or what my uh, position is, is that every one of these heroes of the faith, they were hearing God speak. Multiple ways and different ways. But they were all hearing God speak prior to the Holy Spirit residing within them. And by faith, they were following, they were listening to God, what he would call them to do. And every single one of them, he was calling them to do some type of assignment, but he was calling them more for a relationship, a personal relationship, a friendship. So what I'm saying is God doesn't speak to robots. He speaks with people. He wants to speak with people because the bottom line is God desires friendship. That's this third anchor I want you to grab today. God desires friendship with you. This relationship, you may pray and you may say, hey, man, I've been a Christian for 50 years, pastor. I, I've been a Christian for 80 years, pastor. I, I've been a Christian for a long time. I, I pray every day, pastor. That's fantastic. What I'm inviting you into at the beginning of this year, though, is just to take another step by faith with the Lord, allowing him to speak in maybe a new way, allowing him to speak to you in a deeper way, allowing him to develop that friendship that he so desires for you. Exodus 33, verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. James 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. God's desire is to build a relationship with his people, with his children, a deep, intimate relationship. But that takes, like I said last week, some intentionality on our part, carving out some time on our part to be with God, to be intentional, to, to uh, be in his presence, to hang out with him, to play cards with him. I know. That one's a little edgy. <laughs> Here's what happens. If it's back to just a simple servant, slave kind of relationship, the only time that I come to God is when I have a big decision I have to make. 
oh God, uh, am I supposed to move? God, am I supposed to take this position at this other church? Am I, should I be doing that, Lord? What do, you, what do you have for me? That's the one time I come to it. Or maybe what we all can relate to when I'm in trouble. Yeah. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, I promise if you will just get me out of this, I will, I will serve you. I will give a big sacrificial gift. I mean, on and on it goes. No one's done that, right? That's the only time. That's kind of servant, slave kind of language. I just come to God in these moments. God desires something more, this growing friendship. This really, I love the picture of what somebody calls it, an intimate ally. I love that. No longer do I call you servants. No longer do I call you slaves because slaves don't know the master's business. They don't know what the master's up to. They don't know what God the Father is revealing in this moment, in this season, this time. But no, I call you friends because friends have been invited in. Friends have been invited to the table. Friends have been invited into the secret things of God and what God is up to and what God desires, this growing relationship, this growing and development. Here's the truth is that God wanted to be your friend long before you ever thought about being his friend. Amen? Yeah, some of us get that. Now, it's shocking maybe for some, but there's a f- few verses. In fact, I want to just share a few verses with you of how God treats those who are not his friends. Are you ready? Buckle up, because here it comes. All right? Those who are not his friend. The very first one is a messianic prophecy. In other words, it speaks about Jesus before he came in the flesh. It's from Zechariah. Zechariah 13, verse 6. If someone asks, what are these wounds on your body? They will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. That's speaking to the scourging of Jesus and what happened. Matthew 26. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal for them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Would not be my response. Man, Jesus is awesome. <laughs> One more, John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Friends, that brings us right back to verse 15. John 15, no longer do I call you a slave. No longer do I call you a servant that's not acquainted with the intimate things of God and what God is up to. No, I call you a friend. I invite you into this deep, intimate ally relationship with me that you might know the things that I'm up to. I want to participate with you in these things. To be friends with God is such an amazing, amazing gift. I can't can't describe it enough. And it's simply because of his grace, the wonderful grace of God. In fact, if you desire to have that growing relationship, that growing friendship with God, I just want to invite you to stand where you're at and just to ask that, that for the Lord. You have a relationship with God. You desire to grow in friendship with him. You have a passion that's stirring in you. Maybe something is rekindling, reawaking in you. You, you, saw, you just say today, I, I just want where I am today in the relationship I have with God right now, I just want it to increase. I want it to be more than what it is today. I, God, I want to be that intimate ally. I just want to invite you just to open your hands, kind of begin as a sign. You're just saying, yes, Lord. I, I just put myself into uh, your hands, into your care. And just slow down for this moment, giving God room to communicate, to speak his, his voice to you. We live in a challenging time indeed. And who knows what this year holds forth except Jesus. Jesus knows. And so as you are standing in faith, just offer that simple prayer from your heart to his And just begin by, yes, Lord, I am listening. Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. 
If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit FCCNAPA.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC NAPA YouTube channel. Have a great day.